Day one of a canonical introductory course in systems biology often starts out with a flowchart that is converted to a differential equation and then finally graphically and analytically solved. The model on this page happens to show translation of messenger RNA to protein. We need to know from where we get this flowchart and differential equation. The cell that is this cartoon starts out with 28 copies of blue protein, one copy of golden messenger RNA, and a fuchsia ribosome. This is time zero. Over 20 time steps, the molecules will explore various spatial arrangements. The ribosome will occasionally encounter the messenger RNA in a way that allows translation. The proteins will occasionally degrade. One might suppose that they individually jiggle in conformation, occasionally distorting to the point that they easily break down, or perhaps they occasionally encounter proteasomes as they float through the background bath of cellular molecules. For simplicity, we assume in this exercise that translation and degradation have no duration, they are instantaneous events. Look at time step 1. Has anything occurred since time 0? We roll dice to find that the ribosome and messenger RNA have not encountered each other in a way leading to translation. As described in the previous module on stochasticity, the dice are a shorthand icon for a rather involved discussion. We also roll dice for this protein and find no degradation has occurred. Roll dice for the other proteins, each individually jiggling around the cell, each open to the possibility of a one-on-one -on -one encounter with a proteasome, and find that there has been no change to the protein level. Has anything happened by time step 2? This time, this roll of dice indicates a chance occurrence of translation, which adds one copy of protein to the existing population of 28. The rolls of dice on the original proteins do not indicate any degradation. What about time step 3? Let's say that no protein translation occurs following time step 2 going up to time step 3, and that the rolls of dice on the original 28 copies of protein also fail to produce any degradation events. We don't make too much of an error, for now at least, by neglecting to roll dice on freshly generated copies of protein that were not members of the original population of 28 proteins. Following time step 3 and proceeding on to time step 4, nothing happens. But in the next interval, going up to time step 5, this protein gets unlucky and is degraded. The degraded protein marked X is supposed to be gone, so yes, we do make an error by rolling dice on it, giving it a chance to degrade again. However, this one particular error does not look too egregious. It is minor given that there are 27 other dice rolls on proteins that are supposed to occur. No change happens by time step 7. Again, no change happens going up to time step 8. However, in the interval following time step 8 going to time step 9, a roll of dice indicates translation. In this case, there were no degradation events. Nothing happens again. Again, nothing has changed by time step 11 in the interval since time step 10. We will skip ahead because the next few time steps all look the same. Now we are looking at nothing happening by time step 16 following time step 15. In this slide, there is a translation. But that's all there is. There is no degradation. Nothing else happens. Here, nothing changes. The rolls of the dice indicate that another protein degrades in this slide and nothing changes in this slide. What happens during the time interval of duration delta t starting from the initial time t0 equals 0? How many translations and degradations occur? These questions are answered by knowing how long we choose delta t to be. The shorter we take delta t, the fewer of any events our double-headed turquoise arrow embraces. Three translation events over 20 time steps. Take the number of time steps across which delta t extends and multiply it by this density 
to estimate the number of translation events embraced by the interval delta t. Since each translation event increases the protein population by 1, the number of translation events is also the number of proteins freshly generated since time t0. Please pause the video to confirm that we can abbreviate the product as beta delta t. Remember that the number of time steps covered by delta t is proportional to delta t itself. Aside from some units issues, the rate coefficient beta is basically the density, that's 3 translations per 20 time steps. In this example, the rate coefficient beta is a bona fide constant. This is because we have included no processes in our model that would allow the ribosome or messenger RNA populations to change. In other words, we are insisting for simplicity that the abundance of the protein generating machinery is fixed. How many proteins are degraded? There were two degradations over 20 time steps. This is multiplied against the number of time steps to get the number of degradations that occur in delta t. This is the number of proteins lost. We just walked through the factors we needed to take into account in order to figure out the number of proteins lost in this example. We did not need to discuss the yellow factors. That must mean that these yellow factors cancel each other out, and indeed they do. We started out with 28 proteins, so that's roughly the number of proteins we substitute upstairs which cancels the 28 proteins downstairs. Why are we wasting ink writing out yellow factors that cancel out? The yellow factors are included to consider the more general possibility of beginning with an alternative initial condition, with a number of proteins differing from 28. Every protein in the initial population at time zero represents repeated opportunities for dice rolls. If we had started out with twice as many proteins, that would be 56 instead of 28, we would have had twice as many dice rolls on proteins throughout the exercise, and double the density of degradations per time, that's twice as many x's in the same timeline. The yellow factor upstairs would become 56 proteins, which divided by the 28 proteins downstairs would provide just this factor of 2. Aside from units issues, the rate coefficient alpha contains the number of degradations per time step per protein. Delta t refers to the number of time steps, and x on t naught is the number of proteins at the beginning of the interval of duration delta t. The number of proteins x at t naught plus delta t is roughly equal to the initial number of proteins x at t naught plus the estimate for the number of proteins added that's beta delta t, minus the estimate for the number of proteins lost, that's alpha delta t x on t naught. Subtract the initial number of proteins, that's x on t naught, from both sides, and then divide both sides by delta t. This approximate equation suggests, at least to physicists' intuition, that a limiting process considering arbitrarily small delta t's will reveal that the slope of a plot of x on t versus t at t naught, meaning the rate of change of protein number x, is beta minus alpha times x on t naught. In the context of a limiting process with smaller and smaller but all the while finite delta t's, can you justify the errors that we made by forgetting to roll dice to see whether newly generated proteins would themselves degrade, as well as the errors that we made by continuing to roll dice to see whether proteins that had degraded would degrade again? The answer is not included in this video. The differential equation is usually abbreviated without the vertical bar, so as to read dx dt equals beta minus alpha x. This is what we mean when we draw this flowchart. Uh, a notation note, often people use an empty set symbol instead of an x to indicate degradation. Don't be surprised to find sloppy diagrams like this one in which the formatting of the coefficients beta and alpha appear identical, even though they have different units. Walking through a detailed animation provides important background for differential equations and flowcharts. In fact, in this case, it provides literal background in the form of faint icons. With this detailed understanding, our use of the differential equation and diagram is finally fully justified. Just kidding, no it's not. Actually, the equation suffers from serious limitations.
the number of proteins over time for this sequence of pluses and x's in the timeline at the bottom of the page anyway is a jagged trajectory with sharp corners the differential equation describes small changes in x over small intervals in time in a way that allows the protein number x to vary gradually we started with an assumption of instantaneous translation and degradation events this ensured that the tedious animation through which we walked jumped between integer numbers of proteins but the smooth yellow trajectory explores non-integer protein numbers furthermore another animation starting also with twenty eight proteins could have generated a time sequence of pluses and x's different from the sequence at the bottom of this page because the solution to this differential equation cannot include vertical jumps and because the solution to the differential equation is only one net solution rather than a collection of trajectories the yellow curve is limited in its ability to describe a realistic ensemble of trajectories. Nevertheless, we use the differential equation to obtain a qualitative feeling for this system, as we will show graphically and analytically. The differential equation describes how quickly protein number changes with time as a function of the immediate number of proteins. To calculate the dynamics of protein levels going into the future, we need to know with what number of proteins we start now. X on T versus T starts with the initial condition marked by the magenta circle at 0, 0. Look for steady states, uh, where the rate of change of X with time, meaning dx dt, is 0. We label the number of proteins in such situations X sub st. Now let's just call it X steady state. In fact, such a situation exists for this model. The steady state level of protein is the ratio of the translation rate coefficient to the degradation rate coefficient. More translation means a higher level of protein at steady state, and more degradation means a lower level of protein at steady state. Indicate the steady state protein number here. Now we need to estimate some slopes. If there are no proteins hanging around, then dx dt is just equal to beta a positive number. That means we have positive slope. If there are some proteins hanging around, then the translation rate is partially compensated by the degradation rate alpha x, and the slope is more shallow. The slope becomes even more shallow with increasing protein number x until it becomes flat at steady state, where protein number does not change in time. The differential equation describes dx dt as a function of x, not explicitly as a function of t. The same set of arrows can be copied to the right, and in fact to fill out the entire plot. This yellow curve passes through the initial condition and is everywhere consistent with the slopes drawn according to the differential equation. Our qualitative graphical analysis indicates that protein level will first rise quickly before saturating and slowly approaching steady state asymptotically. We can supplement our graphical work analytically. Take the original differential equation and factor out the alpha on the right hand side. Call the quantity in parentheses s on x. The difference between beta over alpha and x uh, meaning here s, is the height of the red arrow, which is the distance from the yellow curve to the dashed steady state line. The initial condition for s is s on x on 0 equals beta over alpha. If proteins were present at steady state level, s would be 0. The chain rule for derivatives lets us write ds dt equals ds dx dx dt. Substitute for s. The derivative of minus x plus the constant beta over alpha with respect to x is just negative 1, so ds dt equals negative dx dt. Where before we saw dx dt, now write negative ds dt. Notice that this differential equation is written only in terms of the parameter alpha. There is no explicit mention of beta. Divide both sides by s, and then integrate with respect to t from t equals 0 to t equals tf. And then apply a change of variables to re-express the left-hand side integral in terms of s rather than in terms of t. We have the integral from s equals the initial value of s, that's s on x on 0, to the final value of s, that's s on x on tf, of 1 over s ds. 
Using our previous work with the number e, we recall that the integral of 1 over s ds spits out the natural log. Specifically, the natural log of the final value of s minus the natural log of its initial value in that value is beta over alpha, that difference equals minus alpha times tf minus 0. Clean this up by writing the difference of logs as a log of a ratio. Exponentiate both sides to get rid of the log and find that s on x on tf, or that's just s, the final value of s, s for short, equals beta over alpha times e to the minus alpha tf. Is this what we expect for this yellow curve? Yes, the vertical separation between the yellow curve and the dashed line at beta over alpha decays exponentially. The rise time t half refers to the time when this yellow curve reaches half its steady state value. Please pause the video to use the expression for s to show that t half is natural log of 2 over alpha. Beta does not appear in this expression. If we change beta, the rise time t half occurs at exactly the same time. Why should this be? Shouldn't the protein number, for example, take longer to rise if we reduce the translation rate coefficient beta? Making beta smaller indeed shrinks the yellow curve, but it also shrinks the height of the dashed line representing steady state, and it shrinks the height of the dashed line representing half the steady state protein number. These three curves shrink together in a way that does not change the rise time t half. If we double both alpha and beta, the plot of protein number versus time pulls toward the left. t half is half its previous value. Because we increased alpha and beta by the same factor, the ratios beta over alpha and beta over 2 alpha are unchanged, and the heights of the corresponding dashed lines need not be adjusted. Increasing alpha and beta together again reduces the rise time further. In contrast, reducing alpha and beta together extends the rise time. The time at which the yellow curve is halfway to its steady state is also the time when s, the vertical separation between the yellow curve and the steady state, is half its original maximum value. The scaling of s is beta over alpha, but the shape with which it changes through time is described by e to the minus alpha tf. This function of time is parameterized only by alpha, not by beta.